Hey, hey, friends, welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. And we are going to talk to a lawyer today. I mean, who doesn't need a lawyer? Have you ever heard the phrase that every good business needs a good accountant and a good lawyer? You might not think that you're at the stage yet to need a lawyer, but we could always have somebody in our corner in case something happens. And he is going to come and talk to us a little bit about different things, different areas in e-commerce where we're vulnerable, where we need to protect our brands a little bit more, and what we can do if we're slapped with undue lawsuits, maybe by other brands, or we're gonna talk intellectual property. Why? Because this stuff happens all the time. What do we need to be careful of? What are we liable for? What are we not liable for? Uh, you know, things like that. And, and we will make Maybe touch a little bit on an exit strategy because as much as when we're starting a business and we're running a business we think oh I'll just have this forever this is gonna be 30 40 50 years maybe not maybe something that happens to you and you decide that you're just burned out on it maybe you want to pass the torch to somebody else there's always an exit strategy most of the time when people have businesses they tend to think that they're going to have it for a long period of time or whatever. They don't really think about the end when they're in the beginning. And some people think too much about the end when they're in the beginning and they think that they're just going to build all this great thing, sell it for millions of dollars and, you know, retire to the islands. And that can definitely be a plan as well. But most of the time we're just starting, we're not thinking about the end. And therefore we don't set ourselves up brand wise or business asset wise to eventually sell our company or our brand or our asset, or even if you're not selling past Passing it down to a family member, passing it to a family member is something that's important. So we are going to talk to Stephen Wiegler today, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. But before we get to talking to him, I want to tell you something. I do. If you've been struggling with bundling or if you haven't started bundling yet and you're not exactly sure how to start, where to start, you're overwhelmed, you've taken the training and you're like, I just don't know if this is for me, or you haven't taken the training and you still don't know if bundling is for you. You've heard about a lot of things. It's a buzzword. People are talking about it in different places. And there are some good and right and interesting ways to do bundling. Some are black cat, some are not. But what we're going to do is do a five-day free challenge for you to start bundling. So if you have not started bundling or you're just not sure or you have done it and you maybe haven't been successful and you're wondering what the hell's wrong with me? I don't why can't I get this bundle thing right? Whatever the case may be, it could be that you're killing it and you just want to know more, who knows. We're going to do a free bundle challenge. And we want to make sure that everyone understands some of the fundamentals of bundling before you even get started before you even decide that you're going to do bundling in a bigger scale, we want to show you a little bit about what it is to create a bundle, how you can kind of create a bundle and see if it, it's right for you. See if it works for you. See if it's your interest, if it helps your creative juices. And we're going to do this in a five day free challenge at the beginning of next month. So I want you guys to sign up for the challenge. Right now it's still a wait list because we wanna see if there's enough people interested. I mean, if there's enough people interested to do the bundle challenge, live challenge, we will. This is only for your benefit and to help you. Like we've got all the resources on bundling that y'all need, but we wanna give you a little bit of jump start so that you can kind of help and see, gosh, maybe there's something I'm missing or maybe I think I know bundles, but I'm not quite sure. So we're gonna do a five day live free challenge. That means you're all gonna have to show up live with me and we're gonna do some exercises. They're not gonna be long. This is not gonna be some big, huge thing you have to commit your time to. But it's something for you to get your feet wet to decide, hey, this bundling thing really is for me and I really wanna pursue it. Or you get your feet wet with bundling and realize, oh, I don't know that this is for me. And so moving on. So what you need to do is go to mommyincome.com forward slash free challenge and join the wait list. And you will be emailed the time when you can sign up for the real challenge when it begins. We are going to be starting, I think the beginning of next month and we're doing a five day challenge. And at the end of the challenge, you will really have either A, you followed all the directions and you really have a bundle you could potentially launch or you realize gosh i'm not sure if this is right for me either way you have nothing to lose but to try bundling and i'd love for you to come and join us and try bundling for yourself so mommyincome.com forward slash free challenge it's not set up yet because we want to make sure enough people care if they don't i'll save my time for something else <laughs> speaking of something else 
I just started selling on whatnot and I'm going to be going live every single week, um, probably around the same time. Last week it was Wednesday and it was a great show and so much fun and I cannot wait to do it again. So I want you to follow me on whatnot. Go to mommyincome.com forward slash whatnot. Sign up to be a buyer. You don't have to buy anything, but you can come and watch lives and see some other things and just it's a fun way to hang out and chit chat while I'm selling stuff live. It's super fun and I would love for you guys to join me there. So don't forget about that. That is affiliate link. Why? Because it's fun you get free credits to buy stuff when you sign up with my link so please do that just full transparency we all get to benefit when we have these referral links so thank you you get free stuff i get free stuff so now let's jump into our interview with steve and figure out how we can support our business even for our exit because we are going to exit so when we go into our exit eventually what we want that to look like and steven is here to talk about that with us so let's welcome him Steven, thank you so much for lending your time and expertise here at the Amazon Files. Welcome to the show. Good to see you. I love the red glasses, by the way. Are those the blue light kind of glasses or are those just your own style? It's my own style. I consider it a trademark. I do a lot of branding and marketing work. And there's a lot of attorneys, as we'll talk about, there's a lot of attorneys, a lot of different kind of attorneys out there. And so this is my, my own personal trademark. So people remember me. I love it. That is so brilliant. That just lends to the fact that we're in the presence of brilliance here on talking to people and different people and what they bring to the table. And as simple as some red glasses can just show that, hey, this is who I'm at. I mean, my signature is this curly hair. I was born with it, but it's one of those recognizable things like, oh, she's the one with the blonde curls. I'm jealous. (laughs) <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. A lot of people, you know, talk about the two things that people need in business the most, a good accountant and a good lawyer. <laughs> and so I'd love to just kind of talk to you a little bit about that. How did you become what you are today? And what is your level of expertise when it comes to being an attorney? Sure. I think my story is compared to maybe someone who's just done it all their life is fairly interesting. When I was um, going to law school, which was now many years ago, I always wanted to be a criminal prosecutor. And so I set my mind to it. And when everyone else was taking classes on everything, I was really like, I want to be a prosecutor. I want to be a prosecutor. I want to be a prosecutor. So I did that. I And I actually moved to Miami and became a criminal prosecutor, which was very intense. And I got it out of my system. In four years, I'm like, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. This is going to be the, this is the hardest job. And I'm always having to go to jail and deal with cops. And anyway, the whole point is it wasn't what I thought it would be. And that's many people in many careers. So long story short, I, I've been living in Denver for the last, Denver, Colorado for the last 28 years. And I started here, moved here because again, I just hadn't, was at a crossroads and my wife and I moved here and I got, I did some civil work for a while, but then I became counsel for at t Corporation and did a lot of technical tech law and and also really learned about how large corporations work and really i found it really fascinating interesting and they don't hire dummies and i really worked with an incredible group of counsel and clients but at the same time in corporate america and i mean i'm sure not everywhere but in most you stay in your lane and you get the only time i get in trouble was when i really was trying to solve a problem holistically, meaning Mm -hmm. look at the whole picture and really try and address how we can solve this as opposed to doing my little thing, almost like an assembly line. And so I found large corporate America frustrating in that respect. Um, Anyway, exited that um, when AT&T got bought. And um, so I got an exit package and I started my own company, which was focused on, of all things, predictive analytics for school systems. And so I started from a, you know, an idea and uh, we had some research behind us, some some intellectual property uh, from the University of Wisconsin and built up this company to be a multi-million dollar predictive analytics company for school districts. And through that, I learned a ton about business. I learned a ton about how to operate a business, what I was good at at operating a business, how many who to surround yourself in running a business, who not to surround yourself with running a business. And basically I saw the good, the bad, the ugly. Long story short, it was the good, but the bad, the ugly. We did very well. Then we didn't do so well. And then I, the, I got voted out by the board. Like, I mean, it was just like, it was a nasty business divorce. And I, it was at the time I was like, well, I think I was tired out, but the point is 
at the time, I was like, why did I do this? This is awful. It really was like the best learning experience ever. So I, at the point I, but I exited and it wasn't so bad. I got an exit package and I took that and I'm like, I, I just really wrote down all my skills and my skills really focused on everything I just told you, which is very holistic compared to, again, some attorney past because I ran a company, I worked for large corporations and I've also chase criminals. So the, um, the <laughs> very well rounded. I just wrote down, so I'm a, I can be, you know, I'm not a wallflower. So I just sat, I wrote down my skills. And at the time, e-commerce was a really growing business and kind of in its not infancy, but it wasn't what it is today and really knew that I had to focus on a niche. And so the combination is that I have a law firm. Most of our clients are early to mid-sized e-commerce clients. And really what we're looking for is the beginning, looking at every client, um, it's almost like a coaching plan. And the fact that it's like, right, what do you want this company to be? What do you envision yourself being in the next few years? What's your product line? Can we identify that product or service that you provide? Sometimes it's an e-commerce service. And can we polish this thing so you don't make any mistakes so your exit will go really well? Because even if you don't want to exit, Kristen, you should be running a company. If you do want to exit and sell the company, that it, it's, it's the same kind of company, a successful company. They're not looking for, you know, unless they're looking at distressed assets, they're not looking for um, a blemish company. So it's really kind of looking in at that. So I find um, that's so interesting, you know, that most people don't think of that. You know, and I think that's a brilliant question to ask someone when they're first starting that never was asked for me. I wish it was, you know, that's one of the things, hey, in hindsight, what can we do differently moving forward? And I think that's so interesting to think is start with the end in mind. And a lot of people don't even think about that when they're first starting a company or a brand or a product line, maybe getting it off the ground, but not thinking. Newsflash, we all die. We all get old. We all decide that eventually we want to retire or do something else. And they there will be an exit. It just matters of how and where and when and what that is going to look like. I think that's something that never really was taught of me. We kind of think, you know, especially I was a lot younger of an entrepreneur when I first started. And, you know, you just kind of think that we're going to go on like this and just do this forever. And it's going to be great when there's so many pivots and challenges and changes. And like you said, things that happen to you, things that happen around you that maybe you can't even control. And so interestingly enough, starting off with kind of the end in mind. So what are some of the questions that you ask your clients when, when first kind of either bringing them, onboarding them or, you know, things like that of what their exit plan is? I mean, are people shocked by that question? I mean, it's kind of a multi-stage question. It's first of all, me getting around the essence of the value of what they're bringing to the table. So for example, if they call, um, and most of my clients are all over the country and all over the world because the e-commerce business is, and it's wonderful because the e-commerce business is generally, you remote. can do it mo yeah. remotely or almost anywhere. So a lot of times it's just a telephone call to really kind of explore who they are like what their experience is in business, what their experience is in e-com and really then getting my essence or my arms around what is it. So for example, over a paperclip company and had no distinguishing factors, um, but they can sell, they can manufacture paperclips for half the price that, you know, Amazon basics charges, which I doubt, but then, you know, that's the, that's what we're running with this price. If it's, um, I don't know, an arbitrage play, then it's an arbitrage play. Most of the time, it's the beginning of exercise is what's the brand? What is the, how is a consumer going to recognize your good or service? And how are we going to capture that and get that into a protectable state? A lot of e-commerce cl clients don't use branders like a professional brander um, because it's an, ex that's ex can be expensive. Um, and you know, I'm not sure they need to or not. I'm not here to opine. I think sometimes a brand helps a lot, but the point is I have to get my arms around like what, how are we going to identify this, the client and how are we going to protect it? or the client, the market, how are we going to protect that? And I really, a lot of my clients enter working with me and my team through, we call it total TM. We have a flat fee trademark package. And as part of the package. You know, a lot of people look on the web and be like, well, you can file a trademark for $299. That's true. But here's the process is, again, it's the same process for onboarding business. Who are you and what do you think it is 
that you have unique that's going to make you successful. What if everyone, every business, including mine, has a unique value proposition? And mine is kind of, I'm very empathetic. I've been through almost everything in my, in any business I've run. So the, um, the point is, who are you? Can we work together? I will answer any of your telephone calls. I will call you proactively if I see something that is, I want to be holistic. I want to be your, I want to understand you and your business because I want to get you to exit. Mm -hmm. Frankly, that's what the problem is, you know. So the point is getting to understand them, picking out those kernels of what's going to be able to ramp up, identifying the issues that might come along the way. Like, for mm -hmm. example, um, they don't have a 3PO or their business plan doesn't look like, you know, they're using Amazon um, for warehousing, but they're, you know, building a Shopify site and the economics don't make sense or this is going to be a terrible product to launch on Amazon. I deal with all that stuff. Looking at all those factors and really, but first it's usually identifying the brand because if you don't have a, a tr what's called a trademark, which is a registration where you have exclusivity on that brand, you're going to have trouble both on e-commerce platforms and ultimately selling the business. Then that it's can't be further from the truth. I tell you that when it comes to branding, even a long time ago, a long many moons ago, I believe I registered the mommy income name at least before i trademarked any of it which actually was more recent than ever <laughs> i don't know if that's good bad or otherwise but remembering that someone wise had told me when you decide that this is the name of your brand whether you're going to do anything with it or not grab every social that you can possibly get when it's launched and i'm mommy income everywhere and that's so great to be able to tell people that i'm like oh you're on social you're on facebook you're on instagram you're here there so it's even though it's a very small niche that i have here with my brand it is definitely across the board all of kind of the same thing so that even the uniqueness of that so that's one of the things i think that people think that they don't need when it comes to like an e-commerce brand is um you know it's some sort of trademarking or they say oh no i'm just launching a product I don't need a social media presence. And although you don't need a presence, it's nice to have those assets because it adds to the value of your company, even if your company is just one product line. So most of my clients, I teach them to get a trademark and they say, my brand isn't really worthy of a trademark. It's just this bundle stuff that I'm making for Amazon. The reality is though, that with Amazon, um, in order to get the top benefits that you need to register your brand and we go to register your brand, you need a trademark. And so this is one of the reasons probably we've got connected to begin with is because these are the assets that people need. And what they don't realize is that once they have that trademark and they have that brand, it is adding to the value of their sellable asset in the future. Um, and so it's just, it's very inexpensive. I think it's inexpensive uh, to get a trademark and to even work with an attorney or, you know, there's DIY options and things, uh, but protecting the assets from the very beginning. And so that's definitely the song I'm singing to all of my clients of yeah. telling them, you must register your brand and you can register multiple brands if you want to. It doesn't have to be this big umbrella like Target where they sell everything under their brand. It's, it's you know, can be very niche, but you can also have multiples. I think right now I have four registered a uh, trademark oh, look them up <laughs> <laughs> no it, the uh, truth none is of them are worthy identify. you'll probably laugh at them um but yeah, yeah i have a few products i have a few trademarks out there um with a couple of parent companies that i have and i found that to be very valuable when i have gone for valuation it seems like it just adds you up when someone says oh you have a registered trademark i'm like multiple <laughs> and we have protections under there i think it's very underestimated for such a small uh, thing to invest in when it comes to trademarking and having some sort of unique now, i don't even i wouldn't even say the logo part it's just the fact that mommy income for example it's the only brand i can use right now that i can you know talk about is a registered trademarked brand of service and so when you look it up this is what you get and so i think that even just that is a recognizable thing it helps me i believe i mean i have no intention of exiting at this moment but it gives me that edge of knowing that we're building something that's building value over time as well because we have these assets what are some other assets that you think are really helpful for maybe the e-commerce brand to continue thinking about that because i know a lot of people more and more nowadays it's more I would say reminding 20 years ago when the internet wasn't as prevalent even as it is now when I started online, a lot of these different things weren't accessible to regular, what I would call regular people. I'm a regular people, <laughs> you know, and so I would think 20 years ago, I would have had to 
call up a lawyer from the phone book, go somewhere, go inside, meet with them, do all these things. And now with so much access, people can do that from anywhere. However, there's not as much barrier to entry. And so I think that's making it a lot easier for people, but they're still overwhelmed with some of the stuff and exiting businesses and things like that. They're just clueless. So what do you think are some of the assets people can be working on to set themselves up for a eventual exit or sale or acquisition? Sure. So the assumption is most of our most of the people we work with don't have the cure for cancer. If you have the cure for cancer, that'd be an easy one. You would create a license agreement. Who cares what it's called? You have a chemical patent and you're going to flourish no matter what. because You have something that's really important to society. Most of us don't have that. And really, it's kind of, again, the brand is kind of the central thing. It's how our client consumers can identify with you. And then I... The asset, the most important thing is the literal element. You identified the words, not so much the logo, because if you look at just Google McDonald's logos over the years, those even McDonald's has changed mm-hmm. their logo because they based on consumer feedback. And so you're, the logo is not as important. Then you really look at, all right, what are the other things you can weave into your brand? How is the consumer going to identify you? One big thing is product packaging. Because again, most of us are selling something that's, it might be unique, but it's also has a function that you're not the first person to come up with a, let's use a paperclip example, Mm -hmm. a paperclip. Someone did that in 1920. Mm -hmm. So the point is how you, how the product looks and the unique identifying features can be protected through copyright protection. Mm -hmm. And again, when we're doing this trademark consultation, we're kind of even if we're just focusing on trademark, we're looking at the entire thing to see what are the, like you're saying, what are the valuable assets? What are the, what's a kernel? And so that is ex- extraordinarily helpful. And also trade secret. So here's an example of trade secret is um, you have a unique supplier in India. That's say you have a sheet, you do bed sheets and bed sheets that have a unique pattern on them. You have a sole source supplier in India. And there's a certain dye you use that comes from the purple coconut tree. Um, That sourcing and keeping the exclusivity of that sourcing and keeping it secret who you source from to get that purple, because I I don't even think there is a purple coconut Mm -hmm. tree. But the point is, if it is, it's pretty rare. And making sure that your contracts with your vendors and your employees are secure enough that no one's going to leak the secret sauce on how you get this material. Mm. A lot of e-commerce you know, com- uh, suppliers are in China. And I'm really surprised a lot of times when I talk to an entrepreneur, how they're probably ordering, some of them order on AliExpress or something. And, you know, the lack of thought that they're giving in, hey, you know, I, somebody else, if, if I weren't an attorney and an ethical one, I could get off the phone, look at the product and call and get the same product on Ali. You know, it, the mm. point is, of course, I'm not going to do that, but anyone else who doesn't have this fiduciary relationship, doesn't have the attorney-client relationship, and hasn't signed a trade secret agreement can, and usually will. So not usually, sometimes will. And so it's really kind of looking at your supplier um, contracts and really looking at your employee contracts and making sure that you make a big deal about the secret nature of your supply, of your supplier. And when it comes to supplier, if you're shipping enough, like a container worth that you negotiate a, 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 a arm's length agreement that's for real with that's enforceable in China. Mm. And um, we do a lot of that type of work. But again, Kristen, we're not at the beginning of the relationship. This is only things that are going on in my mind and questions mm-hmm. I'm asking of the entrepreneur. I have to really get to know what the, where they are, where they think they're going to be. It's kind of almost like a, you know, going to a psychologist and Trust me, I'm not a psychologist, but I could use one. But the point is, it's, uh, <laughs> can't we is, all? Uh, is I'm gauging that in a in my professional consultation to really understand the entrepreneur. And then these are things that I might bring up at a certain time, but I know at the beginning what we really need is you know to protect the brand and give the person the, the runway to do that. Now another thing that related to the assets, so you build all these. So most of the assets are intangible. Some of them are t- intangible means you can't touch a trademark. Uh, I guess you could touch the paper the trademark's on. But uh, so, so those are called intangible assets, or, and a lot of it's called intellectual property. Assets. But then there's tangible assets. All right, the container's coming in. 
and I don't have a warehouse to put it in. And I found my, uh, this warehouse has, this after actually happened to me personally, uh, mm-hmm. that stores food. And then you're like, have you ever, do they have a lift gate? You know, all these things that, that a lot of the entrepreneurs have never received a shipment before um, and don't know what to look for even in the shipping contract. So a lot of times it's just dealing with those issues of insurance, the warehouse relationship, the sometimes it, it, they'll have distributors in other countries and it's the pricing model. There's a whole bunch of things that happen in the distribu- in the physical model. Mm. The, yeah, the supply chain, everything from ordering, manufacturing, that's, that's exactly who's liable for what at one point. That's another question that kind of came up with some of my clients was um, they're having a, it's a white label. Um, so it's already being manufactured and they're kind of rebranding it and putting it in one of their bundles. So we do bundles where we're using multiple wholesale items to create things like gift sets and accessory packs and things like that. It's very advantageous to do that on Amazon to make the most money on bundling products together. But you're not necessarily manufacturing to down to the T, all of the items. Uh, some of them are going to be imported or some of them are just going to be white label. Maybe one lady I know is making wine glasses and she's hand etching them with different names and kind of customizing that. But everything else in the package is, you know, little wine stem, you know, charms and just some other wine related gifts that she has in there. And so she was asking me, you know, who's, what's the liability for this if something happens? Is it me? Is it the manufacturer over here? You know, so things like that. So for protection wise overall even with those things it's helpful to have contracts in place and who's doing what when it comes to the supply chain and even liability but even still you mentioned something earlier and i wanted to touch base on that before we go here is the concept even of when you're, we're talking exiting because i know you're, you're definitely an expert in talking about exiting a business and whether that's acquisition sell whatever is this process of due diligence i think most people don't really even a lot of the clients i know have no idea what that means <laughs> it's like right. doing this due diligence i've been through the process so i definitely have some <laughs> Was that PTSD about some of it? <laughs> because I had no idea when it's like, oh, we're going to go through this due diligence process. And I'm like, okay, what is this? Because that's like lawyer speak for paperwork. But the whole process of due diligence is another attorney on the, usually on the buyer side, that's looking to put your company through the ringer to decrease the value because you're not going to have most of this paperwork. So they put, or not most, but a lot of entrepreneurs don't have everything put together nice and neatly. And what happens is it then it creates an issue and that the price that you were originally offered tends to go down. That's the game. And so my entire purpose of existing is to get entrepreneurs to the point um, where they're successful businesses and they're going to do very well at that game. Hmm. And, and when you say that they don't have, that's what I call paperwork, when you call due diligence, it's a lot of the financials and a lot of the, you know, kind of putting your duckies in a row when it comes to that. And that's something that you guys take on and provide for all levels of businesses. Cause like that, you're going to be my main referral if that's something. I'm constantly yeah. starting people, telling them, the, keep your duckies in a row. You can come just in two case. ways. <laughs> some, like I have a call this afternoon with someone that's selling their business. I, I work with a lot of e commerce brokerages, a few a lot and I'll come in at the end, then we'll start looking at the business because they I wasn't their counsel along the way. But when I'm looking, we're talking about the types of clients that want to start or are in a growth stage, then I am when I have that first call for a trademark, I'm starting to think about the steps we need to fill in to get and it's going to be small at first. Mm-hmm. But during the period of time that we work together, to the point where you just have, this is all organized, it's all um, focused, and it's it's great. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of like you can look at it in two ways. And so then the, you know, usually with a startup or early stage organization, we just do a flat fee. And again, I'm really focused on the, the kernel. And I'm, but I, the whole time, I'm like, I'm starting to plot out the stuff and look at the organizational structure. If it's a one, if it's a three person LLC say, well, where's the operating agreement? How, do, how is this going to work? What happens if someone dies, et cetera? And, and then, you know, sometimes it's, what are you talking about? Um, someone told us just to form an LLC. So it's, all right, well, let's have a discussion. Um, because the, you know, a, a choir is not going to work at all. And chances are one of the partners is not going to work either at a certain stage. So the point is, it's like, that's why everyone comes in at a different, we're all at different individuals. But there's definitely e- uh, practices in e-commerce, especially, and especially the kind of acquisitions you see where you start 
knowing what that due diligence packet's going to look like. And my whole goal is to take the client every step along the way where it's going to be a move towards good organization, meaning you call that a business structure. Like is it a corporation, a C-corp, a S-corp? Um, what's a taxation? Are you set up for to pay sales tax? Do you have a nexus to do state income debt? There's so many things, mm -hmm. but it's not like we talk about them often. And I just want to finish with that, Kristen, if we're running out of time, is the attorney relationship. Who am I compared to your C team? Mm -hmm. So a lot of entrepreneurs are scared to talk to attorneys. I get it. When I was an entrepreneur, the last person I wanted to talk to was an attorney, and I am one. Mm -hmm. So it's, I understand. What do you think? That, what's the reason? Well, the entrepreneurs, and it's a good reason, I always think that the clock is running when they call. And a lot of attorneys, and I think I'm an exception to this, but a lot of attorneys have never had a business. Mm -hmm. They're worse. We study and we're subject matter experts and we understand the interrelations in the law, but it wouldn't be who you would want to have a, a business relationship partnership with because they don't, I think a lot of attorneys wouldn't know the difference between an LLC and a corporation. But the point is it's, it's not always a holistic relationship, meaning it's not always um, what I'm describing, mm -hmm. but I think also you have to understand that, um, Attorneys, business attorneys and IP attorneys, which is what trademark is, and, and e let's just call them e-commerce attorneys. We know how to dodge in and out of your relation of a relationship. Meaning when I'm talking to you, I am gauging what I need to know about you and the business. And I know that you're going to, I'm going to encourage you to build a C-suite team. Meaning as you grow, if you grow, you could be a solopreneur. That's fine. But you're probably going to need some help along the way. And you need a man, you need someone to manage maybe the operations. You need someone to manage the marketing for sure. And you need maybe, you know, someone to manage the finances. So that's called your doesn't have to be official corporate suite, but you, that's who you're going to be talking to every day, a lot, maybe even if it's virtual, maybe three times a week, whatever. But that's your team. You don't need the attorney in on that team. We have this kind of separate relationship that is. It's a cool thing to be in my shoes because it's, I really, a lot of things that my clients tell me, they would never tell their C-suite team and vice versa. I don't need to know the details of what shipments came in or when the, or that you're even shipping through China as compared as a pair to India. It's not, that's my, I'm really looking at like, where are the danger zones? How can we fit that? How can we smooth out those danger zones? Is the entrepreneur going to have an issue with some of the C-suite team and we're going to have a business divorce on our hands. Can we get this company to growth? Is it not a growth company? Can we discuss that? Can we discuss how it's going to be a growth company? It's really like all these separate discussions. And so my best clients, which I um, are ones that I have a really, it's an incredibly intense, but quick relationship with meaning it's, you know, I might talk to them once a month, um, but in some of them once a year, but the point is, um, I, it's a separate but sacrosanct relationship. And what we're looking for, again, is really the big picture. How can we fill in the legal goals? How can we document? Again, Kristen, because ultimately you might not ever want to sell the business, but you want to have a business that could withstand due diligence. Yeah. It's, that's crazy. I mean, I would, it's like everyone's using a due diligence tech checklist. Like this is all the things you have to have in a row in order to even consider this process. I just remember being kind of blindsided by it at first. Um, that's intentional on their side. So yeah, when you get there, as Kristen has, it's, it's just a game. It's just a, it's a really intense chess game. Yes. And I will work when I'm in that process, I will work, you know, 80 hours a week just on that because I have a team so I can do that but I you know it's all hands on deck it's you're always outnumbered or generally because again you're the entrepreneur they're a lot of times they're a big company and they're backed by banks you know a lot of it is an exercise and then you have to smooth over some rough edges usually but it, it, it's an intense process so and it but I think the whole process of having a lawyer on your team is it's not only for due diligence it's just to, to Every entrepreneur should want to um, maximize their value yeah. that they're bringing to the market. If you can't justify that, you know, there's other reasons to be in business, but that's usually not a growth company. That's not a, a company mm -hmm. that um, is, is really going to go anywhere. 
Yeah, that's so true. I'm just thinking about all the different things. And I think that sometimes just overwhelms at first when I think about that. You always, you know, I mean, I'll be honest with my whole life and just the jokes about lawyers and this and that is just, you know, I'm sure you've <laughs> heard them all at this point, but it's almost like we're taught or I was at least in where I came from that lawyers are not bad, but it's just all oh, that necessary evil. If you get sued, if you get into trouble, you need a lawyer to where I was, the picture was never painted for me until recent years that if this is someone that you want and need in your corner that's going to advocate for you and protect you and, and set you up for success. They're not your enemy and only defending you when you do something wrong, but they're actually there to advocate for you and your rights and even educate and teach you on the things that you need to be doing in order to protect yourself and or grow in such a way that um, you need protection. And I've heard that you don't need a lawyer till you need a lawyer. You know, it's like you don't need a trademark until you realize that someone violated your, you know, someone stole something from you and now you're at the point where well, trademark would have been helpful here because now someone's ripping me off and I have no ground to stand on. And so, um, you know, as we're learning, that's why I always, a uh, mantra that we have in our house is if we know better, do better. Like you don't always know better, but once you do, it's, it's time to be accountable and to do better. And so that's what, that's reshaped my ideas with working with attorneys. And now I can't, I can't not have that. It's like on speed dial sometimes to be like, do I need to worry about this? Those are, you know, usually cost either nothing or next to nothing. It's mm -hmm. like, that's a welcome communication by an attorney because we don't, I mean, listen, there's litigators out there and I litigate only trademark stuff, but I do litigate, but, and I don't mind fighting, but the, the goal is to avoid all that stuff. That's, it's costly. And then you really like, you're turning, your C-suite becomes, uh, oh yeah, I have to worry about that too. I'm calling the attorney. I'm speaking to them all the time. 20, it's I'm almost eight hours a day because you're in litigation. You know, it's like a really big deal. And I mean, it could mean the success or failure of your company. We want to. The best relationship with an attorney is to avoid all that stuff. And um, most people do. Most people do. Yeah. But when they don't, they really don't. And <laughs> part of it is partnership disputes are for real. So if you think you have disagree or potential disagreement or you're not even, you might like them now, but watch any show that you watch partners start fighting. You better have the roadmap laid out just like if you were a multimillionaire and you we're going to pass away without a will. That's really a dumb idea. So um, <laughs> honestly, it. I've it been was... on, I mean, you, and most people don't know a lot of this stuff, but I've been on, I've been in several partnerships. One who, one that just, you don't know till you know. Like, I think a lot of people, they enter into partnerships and it's this honeymoon phase of sunshines and rainbows. We're best of friends. There's no way anything could happen, all this different stuff. And it's, it's when the rubber meets the road, when there will be, you know, disagreements between partners. And what you're, sometimes what you have set up legally is your only the only thing that you could have that benefits you or saves you or protects you from any sort of thing. If there's nothing in writing, then what? Then how? I mean, I always caution people when I've had many people over the years come to me and say, talk to me about partnerships. Talk to me about that. Like, you've been through this. You've been on that. And my answer is always run for the hill. Well, <laughs> Don't it's, be it's in a partnership, <laughs> especially if they're very entrepreneurial minded, because honestly, a lot of entrepreneurs, they were by nature designed to be the founder, the head person, the person in charge. And when you're partnering with somebody, usually that comes into play at some point. If you have two entrepreneurs who are very strong personalities, good leaders, things like that, putting them in together into a partnership, there's always, there's definitely going to be friction, even if you're the best of friends, because um, always there's usually a push pull there. I'm not saying that partnerships cannot be beautiful and wonderful and amazing and all that. Cause I'm, you know, there's years and years of history of that, but in my experience with a lot of different people that I've interacted with and talked to about that have had many failed partnerships and then they say the never again. Uh, and so that, it, and I think most of the time with those partnerships, a simple legal agreement and having an attorney and having that paperwork drawn up and just in case, almost like a prenup kind of thing, like right. you said. Um, they call it a buy so yeah. Yeah, it's, but it's, something like that happens that's okay. If in an event we get to the point where we can't agree or someone wants to leave or someone wants to change the direction and it's not jiving anymore, more, that you have this thing in place that can help you exit. Like you said, a business divorce can be good or bad. A regular divorce can be good or bad, depending on you know the people and what's in place there. So I think that those are things that are just really important for people to understand, not to be afraid of this kind of this help. It's wisdom to have, like I said, it's called counsel for a reason. Right. I well, love that. Well, and there's that. one more thing that I see all the time with entrepreneurs, even if they're solopreneurs, is their C-suite or whoever they need to help grow the company, they give away much too much equity 
much too fast. And then the question is, should they even be giving equity, period? And so, and then the third question is, you didn't even come close to the right paperwork to even do this. So the, and you could be violating securities laws. So the three things are like, it's important to have a discussion on that. So it's really, there's different things that are just like, you need to talk to an attorney, but there's also, it's much easier if, again, if the, if you have a relationship with one, it could be, I have plenty of clients that it's really, I have notes. I remember them. I have a good memory for like facts and, you know, but we, they're plugging away. So business plan is maybe not booming, but it's doing fine. And, you know, we don't talk that often or if, and sometimes I'll pick up the phone to just see how things are doing. But it's, it, so it's not, it, that's what I mean about dodge in and out. It's kind of like, once you have the relationship, then you have a feeling, then you have a feeling on how it works. Then you have a feeling on when you need to discuss this kind of stuff with them. Then you have a feeling of maybe they should get me a good account too, because this is getting more complicated for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and a, that's another issue I see is a lot of, you know, accounts, if they have the same account that they had when they started the business, some of the stuff is not, interstate commerce is not amateur hour when it comes to to no. taxes it just isn't and so we run into some tax issues and that how that affects due diligence it's all like one big domino effect so we just want to you know keep it all even keel keep it on in place and it's really if you're doing prophylactic stuff um there might be some projects that are expensive but the, the discussion of hey am i in the right place on this is again very inexpensive very and i emphasize very because it's again we're trained to do so it's issue spot that's what we did in law school so, you know, that's my niche and it's, and what I do is uh, if anyone wants to first I have a lot of valuable resources on my website. Yeah. That's what um, I was going to ask you next is like, where can people connect with you to kind of start this relationship and at least learn from you and look some, at some resources and figure out which way that they might, you know, come in contact and decide, okay, I want to start this relationship. I want to have an attorney in my corner. I want to have someone who is advocating for me and on my side in these different ways. Oh, what's the best way for them to uh, reach out to you or to connect. Sure. So my website is W emerge, E M E R G E. Like you're emerging console, C O U N S E L dot com. And there's a whole, uh, articles and blogs. And a lot of them are geared towards e-com, not all. And it goes everywhere from working with software like Helium 10 to my last one is, did you really, you know, how does an e-commerce seller pick the right entity? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it, it kind of, Maybe goes into a little too much detail. We'll see because I just published it yesterday. But the point is, it's really like there's some information articles. To build a relationship, we offer free initial consults because, again, all we're going to talk about is who you are, who I am, and what kind of business you want to grow and see if there's any, if there's synergies. And sometimes it's, hey, I know this other consult from their experts and say it's, I know a lot about e commerce. <laughs> but, so, but sometimes it's, or there's a tax issue or something. Um, or it's a patent. I don't, I can identify patents, but I don't write them. You know, we're going to outsource or we're going to provide referrals. Um, but anyway, that's the purpose of the initial telephone call. And that's, you know, completely complimentary. And then, you know, usually for our, our kind of beginning package, we have packages, we have flat fees because I, again, I know people freak out to legal bills. That's, mm -hmm. I get used to them, but at the beginning of the relationship, you know, they want to kind of know this. These people are not out to um, bill me as their, I'm their sole client. They have enough to do, but they, uh, you know, there's a building trust and building and win relationship. And again, Kristen, I think you know that it's all, if it's an e-commerce client, it's all to get to the point of, um, hey, is this a, no one's going to do perfect in due diligence, but is this, did you do anything like where this is either not done or it's done so poorly that like on LegalZoom or something, nothing is LegalZoom, but that's not a, a it's a form service and mm -hmm. what's in those forms. If you don't understand it, don't do it. And if it's too easy, it's probably not a good legal form because mm -hmm. everyone has That's to be a great piece of advice. If you can understand it and you're not a lawyer, it's probably not good enough. <laughs> because it's like, there's so many complex things. And the, in it, again, when you get to due diligence and if they saw a three page operating agreement, say you had an LLC, most good operating agreements that have more than one party, like two parties, are going to be 50 pages. And mm -hmm. they're going to be specifically focused on every on that particular business. This person will help, help handle shipping. 
Um, and so if you're not doing that, you're almost better not have. I mean, I this isn't mm -hmm. legal advice because I don't know the I have to know what who the client is, but that is really like a red herring. That is it leads to litigation, uh, it leads to really bad results when you try and change it. So and then at that point, you know, not everyone might be in agreement that mm -hmm. a better operating agreement is in their best interest because they're fighting. So it's just like all these things like, and, and sometimes you don't have to listen to me, that's yeah. okay. but <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to speak my mind. And that's all usually done in the initial consult and through some of our early stage work. Then the only thing to do is come back and review the business. And most of the time the business grows in complexity. And so does the entrepreneur. They get more sophisticated and they, they call when they know we need to have a discussion mm -hmm. when something happens. Yeah, so, for sure. I know all, you know, you don't need, you don't need the wall to the, um, you know, the same wall that they have at the United States embassy in, in Russia or something, you know, you don't need that, but you need some kind of wall. And then as you grow, the wall gets bigger and then the wall gets bigger and then you might need that wall someday. I mean, I, that's a pretty big wall, but the point is that's how I kind of look at it. So we need something and then we build on when the business grows. Yeah, that's amazing advice. And just starting small, you know, that's part of what I teach in my book too, is like dreaming big, but we step really small. We take this next step that's in front of us and we have some wisdom and wise counsel from other people to help build what we have. I mean, solopreneurship is great, but any of us knows if we've ever worked solo for a time, if we're growing something significant and having an impact on the world and our own families and our own lives, that we're going to need a team of people. And that needs to include <laughs> accountants and lawyers and marketing and CFOs and all the different things that we need. So thank you again for coming. I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing, talking to any other person. And I don't take that for granted. I appreciate your time and your expertise, all of your links for your LinkedIn, your website, everything else. You guys they are below this video. They're in the show notes. And in that you can also find this. We'll, it, it always turns into a blog on our website. So if you're typing in the Amazon files, mommy income, you're going to find this episode and reach out to Steven and his team and just see, you know, just have that initial conversation. It's just a conversation. It's something that you can say, you know, you can build Build trust with someone and realize this is my business this is where i'm going but y'all i will give you one step before that before you call steven and his team i want you to sit and think about and maybe answer these three questions what do you want from your business what do you intend to grow it into what is your desire you guys know in the book you're in a perfect world you know building that out what do you want to see with this do you want to build up a brand that's recognizable that then you can sell for 10 million dollars and move on with your life and retire in the islands great if you want to grow a company and want to be the next oprah that's great too but you have to decide what you want and and then submit to the fact that you can't do it all yourself. You're going to need help. And the people around you that you bring to the table, uh, it's up to you. And you can work with trustworthy people. You're going to need a lawyer and an accountant. <laughs> we talked about that last month. So if you didn't see that episode, go talk about your accounting and get your financial duckies in a row. That's important. And then this is just about not just protecting, but also protecting your future for growing your company into whatever you want it to be. And some of us aren't interested in growing billion dollar companies. We're just like, so I make a decent living doing something that I love and want to retire, want to sell it to someone or, you know, move to operations to someone else so I can, you know, live off the royalties. I don't know, you know, lots of different goals here, but we really appreciate your time and energy and thank you for coming. Y'all, I know you could be somewhere me. else doing any other thing. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast and we'll see you guys next week.